At the end of 2020, Congress added a new reporting requirement for every entity that does business in the United States. Probably you're going to be affected if you deal with any sort of entities, whether you're a CPA, attorney, or just an advisor who has clients who have entities. The Corporate Transparency Act is coming for you. Hi, I'm John Strohmeyer with Strohmeyer Law. Today, we're going to go over the Corporate Transparency Act, what it means for business owners, entity owners, and folks who help them with those entities. So in a nutshell, what is the Corporate Transparency Act doing? So starting January 1, 2024, a reporting company, capitalized term, must disclose information about itself, its company applicants, another defined term, its beneficial owners, another defined term, to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is part of the Department of the Treasury. Well, that seems simple. We just have to have every entity tell FinCEN about itself, whoever the company applicants are, and whoever those beneficial owners are. I guess we're done here, right? Nope. Uh, let's get more into this. Really, what this is all about is how do we give more information to FinCEN as part of combating money laundering, oligarchs, bad money, money laundering, bad people doing bad things with bad dollars. So the good news is we only have about 12 and a half months left as of the time we're recording this video. The bad news is we only have about 12 months left until this goes into effect. That means is there's lots of time for advisors to get ready for this. We want to make sure that we're able to tell our clients what they need to be doing. So at the top end, here's what you should be thinking about. What do you need to report? When do you need to report it? And ultimately, what happens if you don't report it? The short version of that last question, it's going to be in your financial incentive to report this correctly. This is not an optional report. This is not something you're really going to get around. These reports are going to need to be filed. So going back to our terms, just to outline what we're going to be thinking about. First, FinCEN is going to be the department within the Department of Treasury that's going to deal with financial crimes. They're looking specifically at money laundering and how they can track that bad money that's working its way through our financial system. The Corporate Transparency Act did get passed because of our obligations to other foreign nations to help combat money laundering, bad money being used for bad things worldwide. And so that's where this came in. Other defined terms we need to think about. Reporting companies. Now, now, a reporting company is going to break down into two different types of entities. What I'm going to call existing entities are any entities that are formed before January 1, 2024. So here we are in December 2022. An entity that is formed today is going to be an existing entity. An entity that is formed in March of 2023 will be an existing entity for the rest of this talk. And even an entity that gets its formation paperwork on December 31, 2023 will be an existing entity. Now, new entities are going to be anything that is formed after December 31, 2023. So not until we get to January 1, 2024. Do we have a new entity as far as the Corporate Transparency Act is concerned? We're also going to think about beneficial owners. It's easy to think, well, these are just the people who own the entities, but it's actually going to include people beyond just the nominal owners, officers, managers, anybody who has the ability to transact business on behalf of the entity, they're going to get swept up in beneficial owner as well. Part of that and part of determining who has or who is a beneficial owner, will be determining if they have substantial control. We'll talk more about that later. Finally, company applicants. This is meant to sweep in not only the owners, but also the people who are helping those people form entities. So specifically, lawyers and paralegals who help people form entities. The reason behind this, the government wants to know who is helping form these entities. They're trying to track down who is doing the bad things with the bad money, and this is what they also want to get a hold of. If there's a certain person who's helping them form these entities, the government would like to know about that too. So as we look at this, here's what we know so far. We have the Corporate Transparency Act, which is included as part of 31 U.S. Code Section 5336. We also have the first set of final regulations that have been issued from the Treasury. These go over who beneficial owners are and what those reporting requirements are as well. There are two more sets of regulations that are going to come out, but unless you work for the government or you work for FinCEN, this really isn't going to affect what you're doing. If you're here, you're likely 
listening to this because you are a CPA or an attorney, you've got a client who has an entity, you're trying to get ahead of these regulations and these reporting requirements before they show up for your clients. Great. That's what we need to know. Those future re regulations really are going to constrain and tell us how the government is supposed to deal with this. Again, unless you're inside FinCEN, it really isn't going to affect much. What we don't have and what we're waiting for. Well, first, the form. We don't know what that form is going to look like. Obviously, once we do know, it'll help clarify a lot of things that we're looking for and how this works. We do know it's going to be electronically submitted. So it's not going to be a paper filing that you're going to get in. It's going to be like the current other FinCEN forms, specifically the FBAR or the Foreign Bank Account Report, where that gets filed electronically every year. What else don't we know? There's going to be a FinCEN identifier registration process. So if you already have a number like a CAF or P10 that you use to tell the IRS who you are for certain transactions, and I've got both of those numbers as a tax attorney, there's going to be another number we're probably going to get. This ultimately is going to be something we want to think about because it'll make it easier for us to keep our information updated without triggering a lot of other filings. As I mentioned, we also don't have regulations on how to how the IRS or how the IRS how FinCEN is going to uh, access and disclose that beneficial ownership information to other law enforcement organizations. We also don't know how they're going to deal with existing customer due diligence rules. Again, unless you're inside FinCEN, these regulations aren't going to change how things work for you. So, why are we doing this? Why are we jumping through the hoops? of having to tell the government who owns these entities. Don't they know it already? Well, yes and no. The big problem, and it's what is identified within the regulations, is that the government is having problems tracking down who these bad actors are and really following the money trail. Once they know where to go, where some of the money has gone, it takes them time to get court orders, warrants, whatever it is, to track the money one step further. By the time that money has moved that one step further, well, the government's still a few steps behind. So what they're trying to do really is cut down on how long it takes to find bad actors doing bad things with bad money. This, of course, means that most of us, the good guys who aren't doing anything wrong, are now set to have one more filing. Unfortunately, this is just part of the trade-off we are going to have to make as part of living in our free society. Good or bad, this is something the government sees as a tool for fighting terrorism, money laundering, oligarchs, and all the rest. Additionally, it brings us in line with certain other anti-money laundering obligations we've made to other countries, including the UK, EU, Canada, and other. Now, what this isn't going to do is create a publicly accessible registry of all of these entities. So unless you're in law enforcement, whether as city police officer, the FBI, or some other actual law enforcement agency, you're not going to have access to these records. This is not going to be publicly available. You may have heard that recently the EU court struck down similar, uh, you may have heard that recently an EU court has struck down the publicly accessible portion of their corporate registry. Again, it's important to note, they struck down the publicly available portion. So what you're not going to see and what our Corporate Transparency Act does not do is make those records available to the public. You're not going to see, you know, Smith Family LLC is owned by you know, Bill and Jane and Joe. These records are just for law enforcement. So again, the FinCEN will be able to disclose this information, but basically it's just going to be going to other law enforcement agencies. So if it's national security, intelligence, law enforcement, that's who gets access to this. It's not going to be for just nosy neighbor who wants to know who formed that end. Great. So if we've got the Corporate Transparency Act, we know that we're going to need to start reporting things. What are we going to have to report? Let's start with what we have to disclose about the reporting company. First, the entity's name and any other trade names or doing business as DBAs. We're going to have to disclose their actual business street address the jurisdiction where they were formed. So thinking Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, wherever it was formed. Finally, the taxpayer identification number, if they are a U.S. entity, if they are not a U.S. entity and they do not have a U.S. taxpayer identification number, then you're going to have to disclose the home jurisdiction tax identification number. 
Now, if any of this information changes, then that reporting company is going to have to file an updated form with FinCEN. So it's not as though you file this form once saying, hey, we're at 123 Main Street, then you move the company to uh, Apple Street and don't tell FinCEN. Point is, once you've got the entity, you're going to have to make these updates. Now, we're going to get to this more, but this is again where the FinCEN identifier is coming back in. We're, they're going to have a way for you to put down an identification number so that rather than having to update the form when any of this information changes, you can go directly and say the FinCEN for, you know, the Smith family LLC, FinCEN identifier 123579. If you need to change it, you go in and change the information directly. You don't have to do a new filing. It's just going to be through that FinCEN identifier. What else do we have to report? Well, there are beneficial owners we have to report about. We're going to need their full legal names, their dates of birth, their current residential address, not their business address, not a PO box, a residential address. Where do they put their head at to sleep and think, I am home? That's where your residential address is. Finally, they're going to need some sort of identification number, like a driver's license or a passport number. You can also use a FinCEN identifier to say here, you know, John Strohmeyer, FinCEN 123579, and then have that information directly correlated by FinCEN itself. For those identification documents, whether it's the driver's license or the passport, you're going to have to upload a digital copy of that identifying document. And they want to make sure they know who's who and how can we track this underlying part of this is tracking the bad people doing bad things with bad money. If those people are setting up these entities, they want to know who's in there and how they're getting it. Again, tracing who these people are. All right, so I mentioned that we have to report on the beneficial owners and the company. We also have to tell FinCEN about our company applicants. Who are those? The regulations, the preamble to the regulations actually say and identify the lawyer and the paralegal who help set up the company. They're trying to sweep in who are the people who are help setting up these entities. They can make the connection between certain people who are facilitating the creation of these entities. They want to be able to see that as well. So for those company applicants, we're also going to need the full legal name, their dates of birth, and their current business address. Not the residential address for the company applicant, but the business address. Where do they go to work? We'll still need that identification number, either a driver's license or a passport or we can supply a FinCEN identifier. I'll tell you right now, as soon as they open up that FinCEN identifier program, I'm going to register for that. I'm gonna make sure the folks inside my team who are going to be assisting and might also get caught as a company applicant will have FinCEN identifiers as well, just so we can update that quickly and easily. And it's something that our firm can do quickly for our, for our clients when we're setting up entities. So like a CAF or a P10, the FinCEN identifier will be issued to you as a specific identifier that will be able to be provided to reporting companies so that that information goes in instead of having to provide that information directly to the company. Now, the companies can also get their own FinCEN identifier. If they do, then it's really the information that everything's going directly into FinCEN. You're not going to necessarily have to give copies of your photo ID to anybody else. I see this as probably an easier way of just tracking the look. Clients, here are the people that go down on your initial FinCEN report for this Corporate Transparency Act. You know, John Strohmeyer, FinCEN number 123579. It's going to be that much easier. I don't have to give out copies of my driver's license or my date of birth. It's just one less thing to have to worry about. So when is the report for the Corporate Transparency Act going to be due? We've got two categories of entities. Remember, we've got the existing entities that exist now, and they get formed before January 1, 2024. Their initial report is going to be due by January 1, 2025. So that means here we are at the end of 2022, initial reports for existing entities aren't due for almost, or for just over two years. The reason this is, these entities are gonna take time. It's going to be on attorneys, CPAs, Everybody who has clients who own entities, we're going to need them to be telling their clients, this is coming, get ready for it. So that gives us two full tax cycles, the 2022 reporting season, which will start in April of 
2023 and the 2023 tax reporting year, which will do that reporting in 2024. You'll have two chances to talk to your CPA, two chances to interact with the IRS, just to be hopefully reminded, hey, this report is coming. The good news, company applicant information will not be required for those existing entities. So for me, as somebody who started forming entities for clients in 2010, those companies, they may not remember that I helped them. They don't have to dig up who the company applicant was. From now until any entity is formed December 31, 2023, existing entities don't need that company applicant information. Now, the new companies, reporting companies that are formed after December 31, 2023, their initial report is going to be due 30 days after that formation. So if you file paperwork on January 1, 2024, you get confirmation from the Secretary of State on January 5, 2024. Then you're going to have 30 days from that January 5 to get that initial report in. The way I think about this, if I'm going to help somebody form this entity, I'm going to make sure that we have all the information ready to go before we fire that information off to the Secretary of State. We want to make sure that we're ready for that filing before we send the initial filing to the Secretary of State. Why? It's the triggering then of the formation that sets in, in line that due date. And I don't want to be late. I don't want my clients to be late either. So that's why we're going to make sure we have everything lined up, ready to go for them before we hit send on that filing request with the Secretary of State. Now, for those new companies, company applicant information will be required. Again, existing entities, anything formed between now and December 31, 2023, we don't have to put the company applicant information down. Anything formed after December 1, 2023, company applicant information will be required. Well, what could happen? What could go wrong? Well, this is where the penalties come in. Individuals who willfully provide false or fraudulent information or willfully fails to report complete or updated beneficial ownership information will face a $500 a day civil penalty until the violation is fixed and potential criminal fines of up to $10,000 and or two years of imprisonment. Now, there's 90-day safe harbor if you inadvertently submit uh, something or if you correct the mistake quickly. The point is, this is not an optional report. You, If you've got an entity, if you're a beneficial owner, if you're a company applicant, you're going to want to get these returns filed as soon as possible. Don't let this hang out there. It's going to be coming for all of us. This is something we just have to address. So starting to think about it. Client has a law firm owned by a single person. It makes less than $5 million per year. Is there going to be a filing requirement? Yes. What if your clients have created a new LLC to own rental properties in some other state, like a vacation home in Colorado? Are they going to have a filing requirement? Yes. Finally, as an example, your clients have a small unincorporated business, something that's a sole proprietorship, it makes less than $500,000 per year. Is that going to have a filing requirement? No. And so we're going to get into some of the reasons why. So we've gone through this a few times, but just again from the top, starting January 1, 2024, reporting companies are going to have to disclose information about themselves, company applicants, and their beneficial owners to FinCEN. Let's dive a little bit deeper. Again, reporting companies are going to have to disclose information about themselves. So their business names, trade names, DBAs, their business street address, jurisdiction of formation, as well as their taxpayer identification number. If any of that information changes, then you're going to have to update FinCEN about that. Well, what is a reporting company? The Corporate Transparency Act defines a reporting company as a corporation, an LLC, or other similar entity that is either created by filing a document with the Secretary of State or a similar office under the law of a state or an Indian tribe, or it's formed under the laws of a foreign country and then registered to do business in the United States by filing a document with the Secretary of State or similar office inside of one of the states. Again, these are entities. Reporting companies are entities. Trusts generally are not included. While you will file a last will with the county clerk, that is not creation of an entity. It really is companies, entities that are separate taxpayers. These are the things that are going to be treated as, or potentially treated as, capital R reporting, capital C companies. Trusts generally are going to be exempt. Estates, 
are going to be exempt. So limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships, certain business trusts that are statutory trusts like Massachusetts Business Trust are going to be these types of entities as well. And the key is you have filed a piece of paper with the Secretary of State. You have requested permission from the government to create an entity. Now, trusts excluded. Also excluded general partnerships. At least here in Texas where I am, general partnerships can be created by a few people agreeing that they're in a general partnership. Because you have not filed anything with the Secretary of State, there wasn't a filing. You don't have a filed on date. Nothing to report. Does this mean that this is a hole in the reporting and what needs to be done for corporate transparency? Yes. Again, thinking through this, the government has asked for a certain set of tools. They're probably aware that general partnerships get beyond what they can get. If it means that the bad people are going to have to use general partnerships, I'm sure we'll hear about how they'll combat the use of general partnerships for money laundering in a few years. As we look at the reporting companies, there are a lot of exceptions. The reason there are a lot of exceptions is the oligarchs and the money launderers generally aren't using these types of exempted entities to route their ill-gotten gains. So we'll talk about some of the other specific types in a minute, but think about it this way. These exemptions are based on some other government entity already exercising a certain amount of control and oversight of these entities. So it really isn't a good option for bad money to be used to route things. So as you look at this, what we've got here already on this page, charitable organizations and foundations, charitable split interest trusts, We'll get on the next page, you know, securities exchanges, broker dealers, publicly traded organizations, public utilities. These are things that already have significant oversight from the government already. Your typical oligarch is probably not going to set up a public utility to route their ill-gotten gains. There's too much overhead and oversight from the government already. And what do I know? Maybe it's routing them into using public utilities. A thing to think about reporting companies will have a certain exemption for entities that have 20 or more full-time employees in the United States. They have gross receipts over $5 million as reported on a federal income tax return, and they have a ongoing operating presence here in the U.S. So again, large companies, they're going to be big enough. They're making more than $5 million a year that they're reporting to the IRS. These are not the entities they're worried about. So those entities will likely have to file an initial report that just says we're exempt. Here's our bottom line revenue from our 2022 or 2023 federal tax filing. There will also be an exemption for any entity that was in existence before January 1, 2020. So this deadline is already passed. These old entities that don't engage in an active business and have not sent or received funds over a thousand dollars and don't have any sort of subsidiary entities. Again, stale entities, they're probably just going to have to file an initial report saying we're exempt because we're some sort of, you know, they'll come up with the term probably be you know, stale or an old entity. My thought, if you've got this entity, it's, if it's not doing anything, shut it down. It's one less thing to think about. Now, for entities that lose their exemption status, say you made $5 million one year and you only make 4.8 the next year, you're still going to need to file a re report within 30 days of losing that status. So you'll probably know pretty quickly after the year end, hey, we didn't hit $5 million again, we're no longer exempt. Likewise, once you qualify for an exemption after filing an initial report, you're going to have to file a report saying, hey, we've gained an exemption, we don't need to do this anymore. Regardless of your exemption status, you're going to be filing something. Even if you're an exempt entity, I would bet that you're going to have to file an initial report just saying we're exempt and ticking a box as to why you're exempt. So we've talked about our reporting companies. Who are the beneficial owners? Beneficial owners are going to be bigger than you think. Even though it says beneficial owner, it is a wider group of people. So Beneficial owners are people who directly or indirectly and through any sort of contract, arrangement, understanding, relationship, or otherwise, very broad, sweeping up a lot of people, either exercise substantial control over the entity or they own or control at least 25% of the ownership interests of that entity. Yet 
People who own 25% or more of the entity, that's kind of easy to figure out. But it's this substantial control portion that we're going to come back to in just a minute. There are some people who are exempted from being beneficial owners. Minor children are exempted as beneficial owners as long as their parents are already reporting in compliance with the Corporate Transparency Act. Next, anybody who is just a nominee, an intermediary, or a custodian, somebody who really doesn't have any power over the entity, they just hold it in their name only, they will be exempted from this reporting requirement. Someone who is solely an employee of the company or the LLC or other similar entity and whose job really derives from their economic status. Now, we're going to talk about substantial control again in a bit. We're going to say, well, look, even if you're an employee, if you're an officer, if you've got that substantial control, you're going to get pulled back in to being a beneficial owner. Also, it's not clear what happens for corporate trustees. The folks who wrote the regulations, wrote the laws, weren't thinking about this from, well, what happens when somebody dies? What happens if you've got a corporate trustee, is the executor a new beneficial owner? We'll have to see how those instructions come out. Now, next, an individual who's only interest in the corporation or other en entity is through a right of inheritance. This is not defined what we're looking at here is, well, how do we know what this means? These regulations were not written, apparently, by somebody who deal, by folks who deal with the probate process and what this looks like. It's not clear if the executor has to file once they take over, or it's only once we know who's going to get it or transition the entity. It's just not clear. Finally, creditors of the corporation or other entity, as long as they don't otherwise qualify as a beneficial owner. So, we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but if you just owe or if if a reporting company owes a debt to you, that's not going to be enough to trigger you as a beneficial owner. So ownership or control. Ownership is broadly defined. It includes equity, profit sharing ar arrangements, voting trusts, convertible debt, and options. When we start converting and calculating this 25%, all of those options, all of that those interests need to be treated as exercise. So if you've got an option to, to acquire up to 50% of the company, even though you don't actually have it right now, the option is going to be treated as exercise when you calculate that 25%, which means even though you don't have 25% ownership because you haven't exercised your option, the fact that you could exercise that option and get 50% of the company will pull you back in. Things to think about when it comes to capital or profit sharing arrangements, those are going to be treated on a separate basis. So even if we're just talking about a profit sharing interest, all you get is a share of profits. If you own 100% of those profit sharing interests, that's going to be more than 25% of those outstanding profit sharing interests. And you'll be treated as a beneficial owner, even though you have 0% of the actual ownership. So thinking, it's not just the people who are down as current members or partners or owners of the entities. We're sweeping up more people who may have interests in the business. Now, if you've got some sort of joint ownership with others in an undivided ownership interest in that entity, that will also get treated. It's going to get lumped together. What we didn't see, family attribution rules. So just because your brother owns 20% and you own 20%, it doesn't look like we're going to be lumping those together so that you both have 40%. Similarly, if a parent owns 25% and their adult child also owns 10%, we're not lumping that together to push the child over. If there are entities that are owned through a cascading series of entities, then your ownership will be attributed up through those ranks. Another thing to think about for corporations, shares owned in that entity, it's going to be the total of either the total combined voting power or the total combined value of the ownership interest in all classes of ownership. This comes up a lot when we have, when we divide corporations into voting and non-voting shares. Typically, you'll have 1% of the value of the shares owns 100% of the voting. There's 99% that has non-voting interest you'll take the larger. So potentially parents who have retained 1% interest in the entity as voting shares and have given away 99% of non-voting shares. Well, parents are in, they've got 1%, but they own 100% of the voting shares. The kids have 99%. 
whether they own it directly or through a trust, those shares are going to trigger that beneficial ownership as well. What about trusts? Trust assets are going to be attributed to individuals. And it's important to remember, again, beneficial owners are individuals. We're going to have to keep going up the line until we find an individual human. We're not going to put down as a beneficial owner just a trust name or just a, another entity name. So when it comes to trusts, we're going to look at either a trustee or other individual with the authority to dispose of the asset. So this means a trustee who can sell the entity. When we think about corporate trustees, it's not exactly clear, but in talking to some of my friends who work for corporate trustees, they're not so worried about this. They're already co collecting enough other information for their other reporting obligations that they're not really worried about complying with this. They already have the information. It's just going to be one more thing that they've got to tell somebody. Beyond the trustee, we'll also want to think about the beneficiaries because sometimes the beneficiaries will be the ones who need to go down as well as the trustee. So if you have a beneficiary who is the sole income and principal beneficiary of that trust, then they go down as a beneficial owner. Beyond that, if you have a beneficiary who has the right to demand substantially all of the trust assets, think about a marital trust perhaps, or if you have a grantor of a trust who uh, where it's a revocable trust, or that grantor has the right to withdraw substantially all of the trust assets, regardless of form. Think about a gifting trust where the grantor has a power of substitution that could trigger grantor tax status for income tax purposes. That could also trigger this. Again, open questions about corporate trustees, but in talking to my friends at corporate trustees, they're not really so worried about this. We also want to think about substantial control because it's not just ownership interests. It's substantial control that might trigger you into being a beneficial owner. So these are people who can direct, determine, or have substantial influence over important matters affecting the reporting company. So sale, lease, mortgage, or transfer of any principal asset. Basically, even if their name isn't down as an owner, but they can say sell this or acquire that, that's going to pull them in. If that person has control over reorganizations, dissolutions, or mergers, major expenditures, selections of business lines, basically, if you've got control, even if your name isn't down, then that's going to trigger you into substantial control. Another way of putting it, and it's identified in some of the regulations, they have either de jury control because they're a senior officer, such as president, secretary, tre treasurer, CFO, general counsel, CEO, any of the titles within the entity that's going to trigger substantial control. Beyond that, de facto control. So even if your name isn't written down somewhere, the ability to appoint and remove individuals, the ability to direct, determine, or have substantial influence over decisions. This is going to trigger substantial control as a beneficial interest. Now, we're not looking at 25% voting on these beneficial interests. It's, do you have it? Yes or no? If you've got substantial control, then you're going down as a beneficial owner. So as a few examples of this, X and Y come together, they form XYZ LLC, Z is their manager, who are going to be the beneficial owners? Well, we haven't put down any percentages, but if it's a 50-50 LLC and X and Y each have 50% membership interests, they're both beneficial owners. Z, also going to be a beneficial owner because Z is the manager. Z has substantial control. So we've got both beneficial owners through ownership as well as substantial control. Example two, X, instead of owning his interest directly, has half of it owned in a Delaware corporation, half of it owned in a Cayman corporation. Well, X, we're going to attribute that interest up the line, go through his entities. X is still down as a beneficial owner. Y is still down as a beneficial owner, assuming 50% interest. Z, still down. So just putting in that Delaware Corporation and that Cayman Corporation won't change anything. If you had just the Delaware Corp or just the Cayman Corp, answer is still the same. X is still going down as a beneficial owner. Now, this doesn't stop Delaware Corp from having its own reporting corporation or reporting company obligations. The Cayman Corp, maybe it has a reporting company obligation to file as well. Why? If it has registered to do business in the U.S., then that Cayman Corp will also have a filing obligation as a reporting company. What if instead of Y owning the interest directly, there is a Nevada irrevocable trust established by Y's mother who is still alive? 
It's for Y and Y's descendants. And we have a separate corporate Nevada trust company as the trustee. Who's going to go down as the beneficial owners? We already know it's Z and X. Y potentially goes down. We've said Y and Y's descendants are the beneficiaries. But if Y is the sole principal and income beneficiary right now, and Y's descendants don't get any beneficial interest until after Y is dead, then potentially Y is a beneficial owner. Depending on how Y can access the assets, specifically the LLC interest, potentially Y is a beneficial owner. If Y's mother has established this as a grantor trust for income tax purposes because she has the ability to swap assets in and out, potentially Y is still the beneficial owner, even though for estate and gift tax purposes, Y is not the owner. Nevada Trust Company, probably going to be down as a beneficial owner as well. Finally, example four, we've got five brothers, each owning 20% in XYZ LLC. Z is still the manager. 20% alone, probably not going to be enough to trigger beneficial owner. Now, one of them is more than likely going to have substantial owner or substantial control and be treated as a beneficial owner despite not having 25%. This is where as advisors, we're going to want to help people figure out what does this look like? What needs to be reported? If you think about it in the context of other returns, like an 8971, we're going to want to over-report rather than under-report. We've talked about company applicants. These are the last piece of the puzzle. So these are individuals who are responsible for the creation and reporting of a reporting company through filing of formation documents, and the individual who directly submits the formation document. So first thing, uh, any individual who files the document, creating the reporting company or registering a foreign reporting company. Inside my office, you know, my operations manager, Brad, is the one who hits send on the documents to the Texas Secretary of State. He would go down as a company applicant because he's the one who is filing the documents. Additionally, I, as the person who's directing or controlling that filing, I'm going to go down as a company applicant as well. Again, I directed or controlled. I was the one helping the clients. I've had people ask, well, what if I, as the attorney, just fill out the paperwork and kind of push it in front of the client and say, here, you put this in the envelope and you send it in? I think this is getting too clever by half. You are almost willfully trying to avoid that filing obligation. I'm personally not going to be going down the line of saying, look, this is too far. I'm going to put it on the client. Again, this is an obligation. It I'm sure there will be some sort of privacy challenge to it. I doubt it will go anywhere. But being the one who's leading the charge on this is not really where I'm looking at being this. Knowing the purpose of the Corporate Transparency Act is not only to find the people who are creating the entities, but also the people who are helping create these entities. This is where, you know, this is our obligations, part of the deal that we're, you know, as advisors who help clients form these, we're going to be caught up in this as well. What if client uses LegalZoom? Well, the regs are, or the preamble to the regs make it clear that using LegalZoom won't trigger LegalZoom as a company applicant. Whoever it is who's pressing the buttons for a service like LegalZoom where there's no specific advice, there's no guidance, but really just walking them through a process, LegalZoom's not going to be down as a company applicant. Whoever it is that's forming that, who's using LegalZoom, they're the ones who are going to be going down as the company applicant. So as we think about it, again, there can be more than one company applicant, but there has to be at least one. You might have just the two, the person who files and the person who directs. It's also important to remember, while we talked about reporting company exemptions, those reporting company exemptions don't apply to company applicants. Company applicants are individuals. Reporting company exemptions are for entities. So even if you work at a gigantic law firm, that is exempt from reporting company requirements, you as the will still go down as the company applicant. So as we think about this, again, as an example, somebody comes to my law firm, we're a small firm, we don't qualify as a reporting company exemption. If I direct my associate, Kimmy, to create the formation paperwork, and then Brad, my operations manager, create, creates and files that paperwork with the Texas Secretary of State, then my bookkeeper, Bill then obtains the EIN for the LLC. Well, Strohmeyer Law already is going down as a reporting company. We'll have our separate reporting requirements. 
I'm going to go down as a company applicant. Brad is going to go down as a company applicant. I'll go down because I directed or controlled. I helped guide the process. Brad was the one who hit send on the application. Bill doesn't go down. Why? Well, he just obtained the EIN. That's really all he did. That is not going to trigger company applicant status. And in a change from the proposed regulations, under the proposed regulations, Kimmy, because she had touched the paperwork, would have had to go down as a company applicant. Under the final regulations, Kimmy does not have to go down as a company applicant. Good news there. One less thing to report. If they, again, if XYZ had gone to a big law firm that qualified for a reporting company obligation, now if we all had the same jobs inside that big law firm, well, nothing changes. The paralegal, the partner, whoever's filing that paperwork, directing and control and actually submitting, those two folks still go down as company applicants. So as we wrap it up, when are these reports due? Initial reports for domestic reporting companies, 30 days after formation, for foreign reporting companies, so that Cayman Corporation that registers to do business within the U.S., they're going to be 30 days after it becomes a domestic company or a domestic reporting company. Updated reports within 30 days after there's any change of information previously submitted to FinCEN. So this could be change in beneficial owners, contact information, or relevant information for a company applicant. Because we're going to have these FinCEN identifiers, rather than having to submit an updated return every time you move offices, or you change something, this is where having those FinCEN identifiers won't trigger that filing requirement of a new return or a new report. That updated report won't be necessary if you, the person who's responsible with the FinCEN identifier, just go and update your information directly. What about when somebody dies? Well, if a beneficial owner dies, the change probably doesn't occur until that future interest becomes a present interest. It's just not clear. Remember, existing entities or reporting companies filed before or formed before January 1, 2024, their initial report's not going to be due until January 1, 2025. Company applicant information not required to be reported for them. New companies, these are formed after December 31, 2023. Their initial report is going to be due 30 days after formation. Company applicant information will be required. And correcting a report, if a reporting company becomes aware or has reason to know, again, the reporting company, has reason to know that information contained in a report is inaccurate. They have 30 days from the date of that change to file a corrected report. It doesn't appear that we as the advisors, even the company applicants, have an obligation to know that something's changed. So if you're an advisor, the Corporate Transparency Act is coming. What do you need to be thinking about? Start letting your clients and referral sources know this is coming. It's going to hit everybody who touches an entity. Good news, and what you've seen already struck out, if you formed entities in the past, if you could be a company applicant for an entity that you formed 10 or 15 or 30 years ago, the good news is they're not requiring that information be disclosed. It's just they're kind of treating that as water under the bridge for us. Now, now once the forms are released, if you help entities form, then you're going to want to add those documents and that document, the information collection to your document preparation purpose and your process. You want to make sure you know how to get this because the moment you get the confirmation that the entity has been filed, you want to be sending that in for your client to make sure they don't miss that deadline. So formalizing your internal processes so you know who your company applicants are, as well as knowing how to get that information from your clients so that you can get the FinCEN identifiers for them. You're also going to want to get that FinCEN identifier when they open that. Again, hopefully it'll be sometime in early 2023, so it's not left all to the last minute, so we're all rushing for that. Finally, provide your clients and referral sources that this is coming. This is going to be a big thing that comes for you know, attorneys, CPAs, all advisors. I'm really thinking about, you know, for the first year or so, it's going to be a lot of attorney work going back to clients, getting this done on an ongoing basis really as advisors who help with clients when we're doing transactions, when we're helping them think about what's going on, this is going to be something that we just remind them, hey, not only did we change this transaction, did we make a gift? Did we sell an interest? We're going to have to shift and report who owns this entity. So as we pull it all together, top line, starting January 1, 2024, FinCEN is going to need an initial report from every entity. You're either going to be an existing company a new company 
or an exempt company. If you're an exempt company, you're probably going to be telling FinCEN why you're exempt. If you're a new company, meaning you're formed after December 31, 2023, you're telling FinCEN about your beneficial owners and your company applicants. If you're an existing entity on December 31, 2023, then you've got until January 1, 2025 to tell FinCEN who your beneficial owners are. Now, it's a lot. Good luck getting this out there. If you've got questions, leave them below. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for watching. If you've got other questions about this, go ahead and leave a question in the comments below. Also, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.